Many in Washington speculate on the nature and urgency of the military threat from China and the readiness of U.S. forces in the Indo-Pacific to deter and defeat aggression by Beijing. But rather than speculating from afar, it is important to hear the candid and informed insights of American military leaders and warfighters closest to the threat who know best what's actually going on. That's why I'm so happy to talk with U.S. Air Force General Kenneth S. Wilsbach. He's the top U.S. Air Force officer in the Indo-Pacific. That means he spends a good portion of his time focusing on the threat from the People's Liberation Army and ensuring the more than 46,000 U.S. airmen serving in the region have what they need to accomplish the missions they're given. In addition to these leadership positions, he's also accumulated more than 5,000 hours in the cockpit. In other words, he's someone leaders in Washington might want to listen to as they make important decisions related to China and the U.S. military. How capable is China's military? What aircraft, munitions, and capabilities do our forces most need in the Indo-Pacific? And how should U.S. forces be arrayed in the region? As the military threat from China grows and Congress considers the Biden administration's fiscal year 2024 defense budget proposal, General Wilsbach discusses these issues and more with me. I'm Bradley Bowman, Senior Director of FTD's Center on Military and Political Power, filling in for host Cliff May. And we're so pleased you've decided to join the conversation too, here on Foreign Policy. General Ken Wilsbach, I want to thank you for making time to talk with me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Well, thanks, Brad. I appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to the discussion. I think it should be pretty fun. <laughs> exactly. You know, there's a lot of uh, policy meat that I, I, I am excited to dig into with you because I, I think you're focused on such important issues out there. Uh, but before we do that, I'd really love, as I often do, to give our listeners a chance just to get you, get to know you a bit. So, um, you know, as a as a place to start, I saw that you graduated from the University of Florida, Gainesville. So tell me about the path that led you there. Well, I grew up in a Navy family. My dad was a Navy pilot, and um, I always wanted to fly. And um, I happened to uh, be in Florida because my dad was stationed in Jacksonville, Florida, when I was in high school. And the uh, closest really big university that had ROTC was the University of Florida. And so I applied and, and got in and uh, went to ROTC and graduated and went uh, straight to pilot training. And uh, I initially thought I wanted to be an airline pilot. And so my initial plan was go to pilot training, uh, stay in for my uh, minimum commitment, which at, at that time uh, was um, six years. And uh, then I'd get out and uh, go fly for the airlines. And I changed my mind after my first sortie in pilot training where we did aerobatics and love the G's, love the aerobatics. And um, at that point, I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot and I was uh, blessed to get an F-15 out of uh, pilot training and uh, flew that airplane uh, for many, many years. Yeah, I want to move on if I can to your current position. So you currently, as you know, but some listeners may not, you currently serve as commander Pacific Air Force's Air Component Commander in U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. For listeners who may not be familiar with that lingo, frankly, and how DOD organizes itself, you know, what, what are the responsibilities associated with your current position? You bet. So uh, on the Air Force, so there's really two sides of my job. One is the Air Force side of the house, and then the other side of the house is my joint role. So let me cover the Air Force side of the house uh, right now, my blue hat, if you will. Uh, that that role is to organize, train, and equip um, all of those forces that are under my command, which are the Air Forces, the U.S. Air Forces that are in Hawaii, Alaska, Guam, Korea, and Japan. Um, and the, the actual region uh, really is Alaska um, from the just off the coast of California, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, all the way to the Indian Ocean. So that's my that's my region of responsibility. And that's a good whenever, portion of the globe, I think, if I'm yep, not mistaken. Yep. <laughs> and so we have about 46,000 um, airmen um, that work in, in PACAF um, in those locations. And of course, um, those are their main bases and uh, we're constantly um, going uh, to other countries um, and um, moving our forces around and, and training with our allies. And so part of what um, what we do um, there is uh, train with our allies in exercises um, so that um, we can increase the interoperability. And in, in some countries, you know, we're completely interoperable. I mentioned Korea um, earlier. We work, we're working side by side every single day um, with the Re Republic of Korea, principally the, the Air Force. 
um, totally interoperable with um, Japan and Australia. And there's some others too that we uh, work with frequently. Um, I mentioned uh, to you before we uh, started rolling on the tape that I'll be visiting India this week. We've got some uh, folks going out um, to an exercise called Aero India um, later uh, in the month. Um, so we'll, we'll be flying with the Indian Air Force um, later in this month. And so constantly doing those kind of uh, training opportunities. And so that that's on the Air Force side. On the joint side, my purple hat, uh, I'm the Joint Forces Air Component Commander for Indo-Pacific Command. So Indo-Pacific Command has a number of components. I'm the air component. There's a, a ground component, a maritime component, um, and also um, a space component. So I'm the air component. And so I, um, in that role, I provide forces um, as a part of the overall joint and if there was a coalition, joint and coalition force to provide air power to the Indo-PACOM commander to execute uh, his objectives uh, for, for our nation. Principally, that is uh, the objective for us is a free and open Indo-Pacific. And so in, in that role, we execute daily um, real world missions as well as training and they're joined. I'll tell you. I've been in the Pacific. You, you saw you saw my um, bio. I've had a lot of time in the Pacific, between, you know, two times in Japan, two times in Alaska, a time in Korea, and four times here in Hawaii. So I've spent more than 20 years of my career uh, in the Pacific. And, and I can attest to you that never before have we been more joint than we are right mm, now. That's good. So in the past, you know, we we would we would say we were joint in the you know, I'm making it a bit crude here because it wasn't really as crude as what I'm about to describe it. It wasn't far off. We'd all go to our own planning efforts and, you know, the Army would plan their thing and the Navy would plan their thing and the Air Force would plan their thing. Marines would plan their thing. And then we'd go execute them and they'd have to happen to be about the same time in the same region. And we'd go, see, we're joint. <laughs> and that's not really joint. That's the <laughs> Proximity yeah. does not equal combined or joint necessarily. <laughs> right. But, but nowadays... All planning starts with everybody in the room. So Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Space Force the start in the room, and we start planning and how we can integrate. And it's very easy for me to say that at this very moment, while we're recording this, and it will be true when you air this, that there is a joint operation happening that was planned from the beginning um, that is executing as we speak. And so that's really powerful. And so that that is what um, one of the main things that we've been been working on in my joint role in my with my purple hat on. Thank you. Now that's that's a great rundown on on the uh, various responsibilities you have. It sounds like you have quite the uh, busy inbox, and obviously uh, your portfolio makes uh, all things related to China uh, particularly relevant. We'll dig in on that in a minute if if, if we can. Um, but uh, before we do that, I you know maybe it's the former uh, Senate staffer or me. I always love to kind of hit the who cares question or why should the listener care. So I'd love to just hear your you know you're not a politician. I don't want to talk policy or politics or anything like that. But just from your perspective as someone who served our country and. Um, has a front row seat, shall we say, in some of the on the region and, and some of the challenges there. Why should Americans busy with their own lives here in the United States care about developments in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And, and I'm finding that, you know, members of Congress are increasingly uh, understanding um, the challenges that the PRC presents. And uh, more and more, I think the the people of America are seeing this. But I, I do think that and I appreciate you asking this question because I think it is important that the average person, you know, on the street understand understands what's happening. Because if all they do is listen to what the PRC says, you might not have too much of an issue. Um, but when you look into what they do um, compared to what they say, um, that that may cause you some concern, and it certainly does cause me um, concern. And I'll I'll, I'll um, recommend two papers that the PRC recently put out. They put out one in August. It's called the Taiwan Question. And then they put out another paper. Um, this was about a month ago um, called the Global Security Initiatives Concept Paper. It's a long, very academic title. The Global Security Concept, sorry, Global Security Initiatives Concept Paper. Um, they're both a very interesting paper. The Taiwan Question Paper 
um, talks about how they in, they view Taiwan and they are obsessed with it. They want it back under their control and they want the uh, Chinese Communist Party to control uh, Taiwan. If for no other reason, that should startle Americans for the fact that they could potentially get the semiconductor business under communist control. That would be nearly catastrophic for the global economy um, because all of our good electronics have Taiwan semiconductors in them because they make the best and the smallest and the fastest semiconductors. And so that that should concern you. And there's there's many other reasons why why we why we care about uh, Taiwan. You know that democracy is is very important to us, and and of course, in accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act, we support that in that. Um, but when you look at that uh, the the other paper, um, the global and the global security initiatives concept paper, and if you just read that and you you hear what the the CCP says, I mean, there's a lot of things that you wouldn't disagree with if all it was if you just you just read that paper because it talks about you know, you know supporting the UN and it talks about um respecting others <laughs> right. and the rule of law etc. It's like Vladimir Putin talks about regularly and, and his representative of the UN. They love they love territorial integrity and sovereignty. Oops and not so much in Ukraine. Yeah. And so then let's so that's what they say. Now let's look at what they do. So a few examples. Um, wh- what about the, the line of control in India where China went into India's uh, territory on their east and basically just took it over? And, of course, they've, they've had troops right along the border for a few years. Um, very, you know, a lot of friction between um, India and China uh, over that border. Just more recently, um, they uh, the Philippines had a Coast Guard vessel were trying to resupply one of their islands and a Chinese Coast Guard uh, vessel that was, you know, more than 1,100 kilometers from China was lazing um, the Philippine vessel. Um, the aircraft... And, and just for the listeners, lazing is when you put uh, uh, directed energy on a target so that it could potentially be hit by ammunition later. That's true. But as you as you well know, maybe the listeners don't, you know, those lasers aren't like the little laser that you yeah. use... PowerPoint presentation, they can cause physical damage, yeah. especially blind people. Buy. Yeah, um, so these are very, very powerful lasers, um, and so uh, obviously that's um, unacceptable in, the, in international waters. But in this case, these were Philippine waters. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and so, uh, and then uh, you may have—I uh, know your listeners probably heard about um, all, all m- many intercepts that um, the Chinese Air Force have been doing. Um, mostly in the east and the South China Sea, some of which are are very dangerous. Um, one that's in in particular very dangerous was one of their fighters got in front of a Australian P eight aircraft, which is a maritime patrol aircraft, and dumped chaff into the engine and across the um, leading edge of the aircraft. Um, so chaff are little um, metal pieces um, that are used to decoy radars, um, but when it was uh, when it was released off the aircraft, it hit the front of the aircraft and went down the edge, and, and they were very close. So one, there was very much danger of a mid-air collision. That's how close they were. I mean, it wasn't miles in front; it was feet in front of the aircraft. And this was in international airspace, right? And this is just this 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 consistent behavior we see from them, where they're making extra uh, legal uh, t- extra territorial claims to to, uh, to airspace and sea space that they don't own and then when other countries fly and sail through those areas they try to intimidate and bully and push them out i mean is that would you agree with that is that a fair characterization i think that's right and you know it go it goes to just bad behavior you know around the world where um china china just doesn't follow the rule of law and doesn't um, follow international norms, and um, they claim, you know, all those islands that they built up in the South China Sea, that that was supposed to be um, international waters, and now they're claiming it as Chinese um, territory. And arming um, those islands to the teeth, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, well, that's great. So the um, uh, one thing I wanted to drill down on is that um, 
you know, it, you mentioned the Taiwan Relations Act. I mean, the essence there uh, is that, you know, that the United States thinks that this um, this this conflict or this disagreement should be resolved at the negotiating table. Uh, and yet uh, Beijing keeps signaling that they're willing to use military force to do it. And one of the uh, favorite pastimes here in D.C., uh, far away from the theater of action where you are, is kind of guesstimating when such an attack or aggression could come. And, you know, many, including some military leaders, have suggested 2027 as a year to watch. Um, you know, I, I, I'm interested, how do you think about the timeline for potential aggression from Beijing, Beijing against Taiwan? Is this a next year thing? Is it a next decade thing? Is it a four year thing? How do you think about the timeline or, or and how can we influence it? Yes, I think the, that last part of your question is the most important part of the question is how can we influence that? And, you know, our, our objective is to indefinitely deter China from using force with Taiwan. That, that, that's our objective. And by the way, that's in their interest. That's in our interest. It's certainly in the interest of Taiwan. It's interest. It's in the interest of the entire region, maybe even the globe. So, um, like I said earlier, they, China is obsessed with getting uh, Taiwan back. And I, I wouldn't speculate on the timeline other than we we know what Xi Jinping um, told his military commanders, which was to be ready to take Taiwan by force by 2027. And as I watched the modernization of the jet, the, sorry, the uh, <laughs> Chinese Air Force and the, the Chinese Navy um, over the course of the last 20 years, it's unprecedented modernization. Um, they've done that by focusing in their budget on their Navy and their Air Force, um, but they've also done that by um, a lot of um, uh, espionage and stealing uh, from the West uh, to be able to modernize um, their force. You know, again, not following international law. Um, they just they just steal the technology and it shortens their acquisition timeline um, greatly. So we're, we're seeing them build to being ready to execute uh, Xi Jinping's guidance to his commanders. Um, so we're see seeing that um, progress. Um, you know, that being said, I don't believe that war is inevitable. And I do believe that we can deter them. And I think that we are deterring them. Um, and, and perhaps we can uh, maybe talk about some later on, maybe we can talk about some of the things that they should be watching in the Russia-Ukraine that perhaps would apply to them in a China-Taiwan scenario. Well, let's, let's hit that right now because that, that was actually on my list. But um, so there's another uh, favorite pastime here in D.C. is talking about uh, um, potential lessons for Beijing from what's happening in Ukraine. What lessons do you think Beijing is taking from what they're seeing happen in Ukraine? Yeah, so I don't want to speak for what lessons they they are taking because I don't know exactly. But if I was Xi Jinping or if I was uh, a, a general in the um, People's Liberation Army, the PLA, um, here's a few things that I would be paying attention to. First of all, Russia um, had a very simple military problem compared to what um, China would have. Russia had um, a mass on the border, drive across a land border that didn't have particularly difficult terrain and face what everybody thought would have been an inferior adversary. What China has is the most difficult military operation there is to do, which is an amphibious landing in conjunction with an air assault across a hundred miles of open ocean um, on a adversary that perhaps is fairly well defended um, militarily and has the will to fight, which is, you know, like Ukraine. They they had um, a very high will to fight aspect in their country, um, and they were not probably as well equipped um, maybe at the time as, as tai Taiwan is now. The other thing that I think surprised Russia, and it should be a lesson that China takes, was how quickly the world came together to support Ukraine uh, because um, they were aghast at the um, the choice that Russia made to invade and they they wanted to support freedom and the initially the economic sanctions came in uh, the economic support uh, all the way you know now to many many countries providing humanitarian support lethal aid even economic support etc 
Um, and so China should pay attention to that because, you know, not only does the U.S. have um, stakes in Taiwan, the world has um, stakes in Taiwan, the region has uh, stakes in Taiwan. And so I think um, China certainly um, should uh, should worry about how the world would come together and um, cr- create barriers and friction for China if they were um, to choose violence. And one, you know, one, one other, uh, one other area um, that, you know, would, would, should be important uh, to note is look how poorly the Russian military has done in Ukraine. I mean, it's been a disaster for them from the standpoint of executing. Part of it is they, uh, ov- you know, probably overconfident in what they could do. Um, but one thing that I've learned in authoritarian systems is um, there's not free flow of information up and down the chain of commands. If I have a problem, I tell my boss and I tell him I'm working on it. Sometimes I ask my boss to help me. Um, and I expect the same thing from my subordinates. If they've got problems, you know, don't hide it. Tell me about it because I want to know because maybe I can help. Yeah, it's not clear Vladimir Putin had that free flow of information when you made these decisions last February 24th, right? I doubt it, but you know that's pretty typical of authoritarian regimes where the boss um, doesn't get told um, true information um, because when they do, uh, the subordinates get in trouble. Yeah. You know, do you worry that do you worry that G could make a bad decision based on uh, poor information? I I I worry about that, uh, but they should worry about it too because <laughs> right. I suspect um, there's some Chinese colonels and generals that aren't aren't. Um, being completely open with their readiness and their capabilities up the chain. And so if, if I was she or some of their very senior commanders, um, I would worry about that. And it, it would, you know, it would cause me to, to pause and it should cause them to pause. I hope one of the lessons just from my part is, you know, someone on the outside here now with, you know, deference to your expertise, but I would hope that Beijing is observing the agility, determination, and frankly, ferocity of the Ukrainian people to defend their homes against an unprovoked invasion. And, and I hope they're wondering whether 24, 25 million free people in Taiwan would be equally ferocious and seeing what's happened in Hong Kong and not wanting something similar or worse to happen to them. So I hope they're, they're, they're thinking about that. Um, I also note that uh, I, I do worry, and you don't have to respond to this unless you want to, is that, you know, that Xi would look at, you know, Putin's saber rattling. Um, and, and then say, oh, interesting, the Americans, you know, didn't deploy forces, they didn't do a no-fly zone, both steps that I think would have been a mistake for us. But then they could say, oh, interesting, we could conduct aggression, rattle our nuclear saber, and then maybe the Americans would back down. And meanwhile, they're conducting, as you would know better than me, a massive expansion and modernization of their of their nuclear arsenal. So I, I do wonder about that. You don't need to respond unless you want to on that. No, I I I, I agree with you. I, I I can't make it say it any better than you did. I but I agree with you. I think that they should consider those things. Yeah, yeah, very good. So let's dig in. Uh, you mentioned the People's Liberation Army, and this is really where I wanted to go next. Uh, w- with your permission, I, I just want to dig into some details on that. So the na- the 2022 National Defense Strategy calls China the quote the pacing challenge for the Department of Defense. Do you agree? And and why is that? I definitely agree. And the, the reason that I agree is because of the modernization that they've been executing over the last um, few decades present challenges um, that are unlike any other challenge we might have. Um, they've, they've surpassed uh, Russia's capability, military capabilities in, in many, many ways. Um, and, um, and really there's, there's not many other countries that really can, can uh, keep up with um, the PLA, um, all all branches of their service, because they have dedicated so much um, of their budget to modernizing um, their force. And they seem to be on a path um, to use that in some way, whether it's actual employment or intimidation um, by, by such force. And so because we have so many interests in uh, the Indo-Pacific and economic ties and friendship and uh, um, allies and partners in the region. Um, and they, they could perhaps be threatened um, by uh, the PRC's objectives, which, you know, from my study, the PRC uh, wants to be the only superpower. They don't believe anybody else could be the superpower. And uh, they expect everyone 
to kowtow to them and show respect and deference. And when they talk about peace and security, which sounds really good in English, what they mean is we can be peace, we can be peaceful, and we can all be secure if you all will do it the Chinese way. <laughs> right. And, I, uh, I suspect the Japanese, the Vietnamese, the Filipinos probably aren't interested in kowtowing these days. I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah, we'd have to ask them. But yeah, we'd have to ask them. Yeah. the um, And, and, and uh, you know, and again, you don't have to respond if you want to, but I like to do little interjections every now and then. Um, you know, it, it seems to me uh, they not only want to displace us as the global, you know, of course, they want to push us out of the region. They want to displace us globally as the preeminent power, establishing a disproportionate influence over rules making. Um, and then really remaking the international order in their authoritarian image. And it seems to me if they're able to do that, if folks don't like what they're seeing in Xinjiang, if you don't like what you're seeing in Hong Kong, if you don't like what you're seeing in the South China Sea, expect a Beijing dominated world order to look a heck of a lot more like that. I don't, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Right. Exactly yeah. right. And our, you know, our friends in, in Taiwan are really concerned because they saw what happened in Hong Kong. As you mentioned, if you, if everybody remembers, you know, China said, okay, you can, you can have democratic principles in place in, in Hong Kong. And then, you know, almost at the first opportunity, they, they made those democratic principles illegal and replaced the leadership with Communist Party leadership. And the people in Taiwan are very concerned about that uh, because they are very fervent about their right to vote. Uh, and their ability to choose their own destiny. And um, you know, we support that. The uh, the Pentagon's report on the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, published uh, last November, uh, said, quote, the People's Liberation Army Air Force and People's Liberation Army Navy Aviation, very awkward names for them, together constitute the largest aviation force in the region, the third largest in the world, and went on to say that the People's Liberation Army Air Force is rapidly catching up to Western Air Forces and continues to modernize. Um, you know, what is your assessment? You know, you're, you're an Air Force, uh, you have deep Air Force expertise. What is your assessment of the uh, of China's Air Force? Well, I think they have modernized um, quite a bit, and um, it might be unprecedented. And you know, while we were very engaged in the Middle East, you know, they were not engaged anywhere. But they took that time to really modernize their Navy and really, really modernize um, their Air Force. And when people say they're rapidly catching up, uh, there there was an enormous gap between the capability of Western Air Forces, principally the United States Air Force, and the PLAF, the People's Liberation Army Air Force. Huge delta between capabilities. And of course, they, they've been slowly um, closing that gap. There's still a gap. You know, we still have um, superiority. Um, our, our um, technology is still better than theirs. Um, and you know what what a lot of people forget is the skill and the way we train. Uh, it, we have figured out how to train air crew. Um, and I'm not sure that they have. And their system um, has some roadblocks in it. We so value um, the warrior spirit and the, the way the, to, to give people innovative ways to execute their mission, um, we don't te- we don't micromanage, you know, our warriors. We give them an objective, um, we tell them a time, and then we we cut them loose to figure out the way to do it. And that's see them. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. Do you do you see them emulating our like red flags and the kind of things that cr- give us that kind of training and operational excellence? Do you see them beginning to? I, I know in the in the army domain, which I've focused on elsewhere. Um, we have seen them kind of emulating the National Training Center, Joint Readiness Training Center model. Do you see them emulating red flag type exercises? I'm not sure if it's red flag, but we certainly see them emulating. I mean, the, you know, very much the Chinese model is, um, you know, copy what works and they realize we have works. And so they they do copy. You know, so, you know, they they like I said earlier, you know, they've been stealing technology. Well, they've been stealing training techniques as well. And so we we see them. I don't know if they have a red flag, you know, something that's that advanced, but they we certainly see them um, graduating from very simple um, tactics to much larger um, tactics and techniques and procedures. So we we do see that, um, but I, I 
I still think we have a, a qualitative um, edge. Got it. Um, all right. So let's, let me jump ahead to, um, you know, just, so that was kind of the, I uh, will call that the headache session. Maybe we'll talk a little aspirin here. I got, I got a headache. So we'll, we'll move to the, uh, what the, what the good guys and gals are doing to address some of these issues. Um, so, um, you know, you're, I, I hear you saying that as the Chinese military is becoming more powerful, Beijing is wielding it more aggressively, whether that's on the border with India or in the South China Sea or in the Taiwan Strait. Um, uh, the, you know, yet that you, you commented earlier about how we're, you know, we're sunsetting, you know, we're, we're, we're pulling out the F-15s from Kandina Air Base in Japan. Um, what are we doing to, I, I would assume, one, do you agree with the value of forward um, uh, air positioned air power? Um, and what are we doing to kind of backfill those F-15s that we're pulling out of Kadena? Yes, I, I definitely think there's a great value in presence and um, for, for a few reasons. One, because we have forces there that can respond immediately if we have to. Um, the other value of having forces forward is the daily interaction that we have with our allies and um, partners. You know, in this case, it's with Japan. And so we have um, you know, immensely close relationship um, with Japan and, and um, we're very encouraged with some of the changes that are going on inside of uh, Japan with respect to their military and boosting their military budget, um, some purchases that they're making to um, upgrade not only their air force but their um, all of their forces. So um, we're we're very encouraged by that. Um, the plan uh, for um, you know future forces uh, in in uh, in Japan you know, has not been announced. In the meantime, you know we we obviously have um, aircraft that are at Kadena. Uh, from other places around the Air Force that are, um, you know, filling um, the F-15s as they um, uh, come back to the States. Got it. And my understanding, those are rotational deployments, perhaps according to public reports, maybe F-22s from from Alaska or F-16s from elsewhere. Um, Admiral Acalino, the commander of Indo-Pacific Command, told me during a public event at FDD on June 24, 2022, that, quote, it would be certainly desirable, unquote, to have fifth generation aircraft permanently stationed west of the international dateline. He said those fifth generation aircraft would be our quote, critically important to the ability to deliver deterrence. Um, do you, uh, well, first of all, are, are there any F-22s or F-35A fifth generation aircraft that are permanently stationed in East, a- permanently stationed East Asia, or at least somewhere west of the international dateline? Not permanently. Um, and like I said, I, I, won't, I don't want to get into um, future things that haven't been announced. But stay tuned. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I respect that. Uh, you're wearing the stars right now. I'm not. But uh, from my humble purchase, seems like based on what you just said about the value of forward posture and um, uh, having our best aircraft forward positioned uh, might make sense. But uh, I will stay tuned. Uh, c- c- put me on your interested shortlist. You know, one. Yeah, for sure. One other. <laughs> one, other um, one other thing that. You know, you're talking about U.S. Air Force, but we obviously have F-35Bs um, from the Marines that are in, at Iwakuni, Japan. Uh, and then our partners, um, Japan, um, have F-35s, uh, as well as um, Korea has F-35. So we, you know, there there are um, fifth generation aircraft, you know, west of the dateline. And then, uh, you know, I talk a lot about um, our forces that are in Alaska. Uh, which we have, you know, more than a hundred fifth gen in Alaska, and Alaska is only nine hours flying time from, you know, that part of the world, and so we can rapidly get fifth gen into the region uh, by self deploying. So you know, that that is something that we we can get fifth gen uh, west of the dateline very easily. Yeah, no, that's that's an important point, and and and. Um... I'm tracking what you're saying about, you know, the Marine Corps and allies having some advanced capabilities in the region. But, uh, you know, I, I would just add that, you know, the goal here is to create dilemmas that are difficult for adversaries to solve so, so that they don't try it in the first place. Right. It seems to me uh, if we can make that uh, dilemma more difficult for them to solve with additional forward position forces. Uh, that might be helpful. And, and then just, you know, the assumptions that, um, you know, maybe in, in 1990, 91, we could deploy whatever we want, you know, unchallenged. But uh, with, again, with deference to you, it feels like we're in a different anti-access error denial space now in this in this contingency than we've been ever, ever maybe ever before. No doubt. 
No yeah, doubt. yeah, for sure. If 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 folks are going to adopt this idea of having more forward position forces for the reasons we just discussed, obviously we need to defend them um, uh, from what is clearly a growing missile threat um, to uh, our bases, including and also a drone threat. I, I would note the same Pentagon report on China from last year said that PLA rocket force launched approximately 135 ballistic missiles for testing training, more than the rest of the world combined, not including ballistic missile employment. How concerned are you about the threat to our air bases, particularly in the first island chain? Yes. So um, they certainly proliferated uh, this capability and they've, they've got a lot of weapons. Uh, some of them are fairly long range um, and they're all very accurate. And uh, so there's uh, a number of ways that um, you can um, perhaps combat, you know, this this potential threat. Um, one of them is a strategy that we've implemented about five or six years ago called Agile Combat Employment. And so, you know, you mentioned 1991. Back in those days, we load up, you know, hundreds of aircraft on a few airfields. And because they were sanctuaries, you didn't have to worry about them getting struck. Well, those right. times have changed. Now you They're do. Long gone, right? Yeah. Right. So what, what we have um, developed is this concept called Agile Combat Employment or ACE, A-C-E. And um, it is um, a dispersal of your forces. And so instead of putting hundreds of aircraft on one airfield, we take those aircraft and we spread them across many airfields. And um, they're all linked. Um, by a command and control network um, so that you have a series of hubs and spokes and um, you can get aircraft in the air. And even if one of them gets struck while the aircraft are in the air, they can go land at a different base, get some fuel and some weapons and then take off again. And um, it, it's the ability to complicate um, any adversaries targeting um, problem. And then while while you're doing that, then you have defenses at the bases uh, where you can potentially shoot down the ballistic missiles and the cruise missiles coming in. Um, and then if you do get hit, um, we have rapid runway repair. A lot of people don't know about our rapid runway repair capability, but you know, literally you can pour concrete in 45 minutes. You can walk on it in three hours. You can land a C-17 on it, which wow. is a gigantic hardware. Yeah, that's a big deal. So it's, very rapid um, capability, and so that that's um, that's our answer to um, the ballistic missile and cruise missile threat. When you consider the main operating bases, or you know the main air bases, and then what I'll call these lily pads that you might be jumping to uh, once shooting starts under the agile combat employment doctrine or strategy. Now that that's a lot of requirements for air and missile defense, right? To protect both the main operating base and where you and, and the jump to sites. Uh, which would imply, I would th- obviously you'd want to have maybe some some air missile defense capabilities pre-positioned. Some I think you'd want to be mobile so they can move around with with the air forces. Um, you know, maybe a sensitive question you can you can answer if you want to. Are you getting the support you need from the U.S. Army on air missile defense in terms of protecting your air bases? Yes, and I'll qualify that with I wish we had started the effort five or ten years earlier. <laughs> Um, um, but um, I am getting the support. In fact, um, headquarters Air Force and headquarters Army have uh, stood up um, a task force in the Pentagon uh, to study this. And some of the capabilities that you talked about, which the Army has started a while ago um, with some much more agile um, base defense capability than what you can get out of a patron of that, which are, you know, they're great weapon system, but they're not agile. Um, and so, what you talked about, uh, being able to move them around um, uh, quickly without, you know, ships or multiple C-17 loads uh, to get them around is uh, something um, that I'm interested in. And I, I believe in my heart that the solution is going to be um, a directed energy um, type of weapon that, that can easily handle um, a straight ballistic missile, a maneuvering reentry vehicle, um, a hypersonic weapon, or maybe even a stealthy cruise missile. The directed energy um, would be able to handle all of those threats just because the, the weapon is flying at the speed of light. Right, right. Could give you some, the direct energy could give you some additional capacity um, uh, in addition to kinetic. Uh, and that makes sense. Uh, we're talking about moving things around. Uh, as you know, I see the map behind you on the wall there. Then, you know, the distances in the Indo Pacific are vast, as you know better than me. 
Um, that obviously makes logistics and air mobility vital. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but I would be negligent not to ask it. Do you have the capacity you need to move personnel and material around? And, and where, are there any particular areas of, of focus or need to make all this work in terms of air mobility? We do. In fact, um, the partnership between Pacific Air Forces and Air Mobility Command um, perhaps has never been um, greater. I'm very um, close with General Minahan. And in fact, um, we have such a presence um, by Air Mobility Command personnel in our headquarters uh, doing planning. Um, he has folks from my headquarters in, in his headquarters doing planning. And and so we we have a very close relationship, and uh, he is he is dedicated to um, supporting us, and I greatly appreciate that. One other aspect of of the logistics that uh, sometimes people don't think about is this notion of prepositioning. And in the twenty two budget, the twenty three budget, we expect uh, twenty four and beyond um, to have you know several uh, several hundred million dollars, maybe even more of uh, money to purchase items that we are pre-positioning. We've already started this purchase and deploying some of this equipment, but it relieves you of some of the, the risk of logistics under attack if you have stuff at the islands you intend uh, to fly from already. You know, things like food and water and fuel and weapons uh, and things like that um, that will already be there. So when you disperse, um, you don't have to resupply straight away that you can operate there for a period of time. And so we're already starting to purchase those and deploy. That, that makes total sense to me in light of some of the things we've talked about earlier about uh, moving things around and, and, and getting access even in the first place into the region once shooting starts. And so that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, the, uh, the, the Department of Defense and the Air Force, as you know, a few weeks ago submitted its, its fiscal year 2024 defense budget request. Are there any elements in that request that are particularly important to you as PACAF commander? Well, I mentioned one of them already. Yeah, and that is, yeah. uh, the, the dollars for pre-positioning. There's some other ACE, uh, things that are funded in, inside of that. Uh, and some of it is construction. And so there's a number of places where we want to operate where the, the runway is not quite long enough. The taxiways mm. aren't quite as robust. Maybe they don't have the fuel and weapon storage. And so we're, we're getting, um, we're getting a few hundred million dollars for that. And so you'll see us doing construction projects to lengthen runways and, and improve airfields so that we, when we get there, we can operate in a way uh, that uh, that we want to operate. And then um, some significant modernization um, for the Air Force, uh, things like the E-7 aircraft, um, which is, you know, my number, you know, my number one modernization uh, priority is the E-7. And the reason is because the E-3 is um, very stressed. It's an old aircraft um, and they're very difficult to maintain. So um, we're challenged to get those airborne on any given day. Um, the E-7 will be a brand new aircraft. But then once they get airborne, the sensors on the E-7 are significantly better, significantly better than the E-3. And it will allow us um, to find targets that we cannot find um, with the E3. And so it just gives us better domain awareness um, and capability to employ against those targets. So the E3, the E7 will be um, coming um, in the near future. The F15EX um, is another purchase um, that I'm looking for that will help us with um, air superiority and um, also um, perhaps um, targeting ships, uh, which um, gets after and you know, that notion that you talked about anti-access area denial and then additional F-35s as well as upgrades um, to many weapons um, that um, will help retain that um, capability gap that we talked about earlier in the podcast. Um, but a lot of those modernizations are helping us um, retain the ability to achieve air superiority. Um, and uh, when the Air Force provides air superiority, not only for itself, but the joint force, we all um, can achieve our objectives much easier. If we don't have air superiority, kind of like what happened to Russia and Ukraine, um, everybody fails. Right. No, there's so much great content there. I'm glad you hit on everything. I, I, I'm eyeing the clock. I, I know we're about to run out of time. Um, but, um, you, you know, your comment about runways, right? I mean, that 
you know, speaking to my former colleagues in the Senate, right, you know, that may not be in the home state or home district, but here you have, you know, a, a warfighter saying that, uh, you know, these investments and runways are critical. I hear you saying the E7 is number one. My colleague, uh, Admiral Mark Montgomery and I have uh, published several times on the E3, E7 issue. We've published with some of Air Force fellows. I'd, uh, I'd point uh, listeners to that kind of, um, you know, I'm glad to hear that our, our analysis aligns with you because that's exactly what we've argued. Um, just uh, real quickly, um, you know, uh, so there's there's a lot to like from my perspective in, in the Air Force's budget request, but I did notice that there was almost a $3.5 billion unfunded priority list. And from my view, China is the number one threat we confront. Indo-PACOM is the most important combatant uh, re- uh, area of responsibility. And yet there's a $3.5 billion unfunded priority list. And these aren't exactly like more golf courses or bigger houses for generals. It seems to me these are real hardcore war fighting capabilities. Is there anything on the unfunded priority list that would be particularly useful to you as you're trying to deter aggression? All of it. All, all, did I hear you say all of it? Okay. All of, it, all of it's particularly interesting and, yeah. and to me because um, we're going to, we're going to deter China um, through strength. Right. And the, the more, the more dilemmas that we can present uh, to the PRC, the better. Because yeah. we want them waking up every day saying today is not the day. Right. Like we talked about earlier. Yep. And all of those things in, in that um, unfront, unfunded priority list will help us to do that. Yeah. No, very good. And, and again, to me talking, not you, General Busy, you know, but uh, just to my former colleagues in the House, House and Senate, you know, it's um, if we say China is the number one threat, and if we say Indo-PACOM is the top uh, combatant command that we need to be focusing on. Uh, if you have that command saying, here's things that we need to deter aggression, it seems to me the burden of proof should be on anyone saying that those should not be authorized and appropriated. That's just my little interjection there. Quickly moving on, um, you, you talked about sinking ships. Would you agree that a primary purpose for the U.S. Air Force Indo-Pacific Command should be the ability to sink ships? Is that is that a core task in your mind for you guys? Yes. And it may not be obvious if, if, you, if you're not steeped in you know how we do air superiority, but it's an air superiority thing for me. And it's because those um, ships that we're talking about will pr- present a surface to air threat. It's that anti-access area denial. So the ships cruise around with surface to air missiles and they project a weapons engagement zone. That means that if you fly into that weapons engagement zone, they're going to shoot you down. Yeah. And it takes away your ability um, to maneuver in the air. And when we, we can't maneuver in the air, then um, our ground forces are put at risk and our maritime forces are, are put at risk. So we want to take away their ability to project that anti-access um, area. Wow. Then the next part of that is they're going to take Taiwan by an amphibious landing. And if the ship can't make it to the shore, uh, then the amphibious landing can't happen. And if the amphibious landing can't happen, they can't take Taiwan by force. And so those are two good reasons why we should be able to sink ships. And uh, would and uh, I'm I'm proud to say we don't take any funding from any defense company. So I'm asking this for all the right reasons. It seems to me long range anti ship missiles would be a key munition for you to have uh, to support that mission. Agreed. And that's a part of that budget we were talking yeah, about. Absolutely. In, in the max quantities available, hopefully. All right, very good. Well, let's move to conclude. Um, you know, so this is the, the the softball I like to ask at the end there. What, uh, is there anything I shouldn't have, that I didn't ask you that you'd like to to talk about or anything in particular that you want Americans to know about the men and women you lead? Uh, well, thanks. I think, uh, one, my compliments um, to, to you as the podcast leader, because I think it was really comprehensive and appreciate the uh, questions that, that you asked. But you know what I'll what I'll tell you. Um, the thing that I want to end up on is the men and women that serve in the in the Pacific, um, principally the ones that are in the Air Force, since I'm their commander. Um, they they love America. Uh, they love serving in this region. Um, they're working really hard, and we certainly do appreciate all the support we get from the citizens of our country. Um, and just don't forget about us out here. Sometimes we're doing uh, some some hard work in some tough locations, and um, I I know you you've probably been out to some of these places uh, in the Pacific, and it's a long way from home. You can't just uh, jump on a you know jump in your car and drive home. Every place where our um, airmen are serving is a very long 
plane ride home. You know, the shortest, the shortest is about three hours from Alaska. The rest of them are a lot farther than that. Um, and with the prices, uh, the way airline prices have skyrocketed and uh, our, especially our young airmen, you know, it comes cost prohibitive to go home. So don't forget about our airmen uh, serving, uh, especially uh, in the in the Far East um, where it's tough to get home. And some of them are there without their families for an entire year. Um, and so don't forget um, their great service because I never do. I never take for granted um, how amazing they are and how um, full of service they are and dedication and love for their country. What, what a great way to end this. And I, I, I will tell you uh, from our humble foxhole here at FTD and our Center on Military and Political, we are not forgetting about you guys. And we spend a good portion of our time wanting to ensure that you have the means to accomplish the missions you're given. That's kind of our, our animating spirit here. And this conversation with you has, has given us some wonderful information to kind of move forward with. And um, they are a long way from home. Uh, but as you know better than anyone, what happens there will affect us here at home. And that's why we want, we want you to have everything you need. Um, and, and Ken, I just want to say sincerely, um, thank you to you and your family for your decades of distinguished and continued service to our country. I want to thank, uh, as you just said, the men and women you lead who defend our country and keep us safe. And to our audience, I want to thank you for joining us here on Foreign Policy. Uh, thanks, Brad. It's been a pleasure being with you today. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Foreign Policy. If you enjoyed the show, please rate us, preferably with five stars. Ratings and reviews help give us visibility and the opportunity to reach more people who seek to understand the most critical national security and foreign policy issues. Also, make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Follow FDD on social media and visit our website at fdd.org. There you can find research by FDD experts, you can subscribe to all FDD's products, you can catch up on any past episodes you may have missed. Finally, we'd love your feedback, your ideas, your questions, your criticisms. Send us an email at foreignpodicy at fdd.org. Until next time, I'm Cliff May, and you've been listening to Foreign Policy.